While the chairs are coming out, I, I just wanted to make some general remarks, so that, just to fill in the background or remind you of the background of what everybody knows, which is that one of the ways that people deal with art is by categorizing it. So one of the basic categorizations that's been around since the late 19th century, I guess, is um, between the abstract and the figurative. And these are often taken as absolutes, that <clears throat> a work of art is one or the other. And there are a lot of reasons why that would be. Some are practical, some are not so good. Uh, they're sort of dogmatic and ideological even. But the, the truth of the matter is that there's no hard and fast uh, distinction between the two. Uh, you all know the big, almost empty, usually horizontal paintings of Barnett Newman. Uh, there's a field of color, and then there are some vertical things. He called them zips. Uh, others have called them other things. <laughs> uh, one of the most obvious things to call them is to say that they're somehow figurative, uh, that they're figures that are even skinnier and more reductive than those figures of Giacometti's later period. Uh, it, the details of it have gotten away from me now, but uh, his friend, the critic and editor Tom Hess, wrote a huge, I think it was Abbeville or Abrams book, you know, in the blockbuster-sized doorstop books, about how um, if you really looked at Barnett Newman's paintings the right way, this, those paintings, you would see uh, a reflection of uh, uh, Old Testament, uh, I don't know what to call it exactly. I suppose in, in Hess's treatment of it, it was a, a mythology, you know. Just for one example, the one that stuck with me, that red uh, has said that that is an evocation, not a representation, but an evocation, and certainly figurative, of the clay from which the body of Adam was made by God, and so on. Um, after Newman died, his widow was so upset by this interpretation that she got Harold Rosenberg to write another big <laughs> book repudiating all that. But the point is that you can't repudiate that. I mean, I, I don't exactly buy into uh, the notion, Tom has this notion, that Barnett Newman's uh, big paintings are somehow a reflection of, of the Old Testament or the Torah. Uh, on the other hand, you can't refute that. You, you might feel sympathetic to it, you might feel unsympathetic to it, you might feel that you don't really get it, which is sort of the camp that I'm in, but uh, you, can't, you can't refute it. And, and that leads me to a word that often pops up in talking with Ford and in reading things that he's written over the years, ambiguity that art is essentially ambiguous. You might say, well, what about a minimalist cube? Uh, don't want to go off on another tangent, but you can find ambiguities there if you're open to them. Uh, art is essentially, by nature, ambiguous. And so that's why we find Ford, who's been known for decades, and celebrated as an abstract artist, uh, suddenly doing a show that has figures in it. That uh, I don't know if we want to call it a figurative show because there's so much of his of what we see in his so-called abstract paintings in these paintings, and yet, and there's there's a, a, a degree of clarity or obviousness about the figures. Uh, that shifts from painting to painting. Sometimes it jumps out at you, sometimes you have to sort of look at it. And maybe there are some cases where some of us won't even see the figure in some of these, but the point is that it's on a continuum.
And the very idea of the abstract and the figurative is on a continuum too. So the question uh, uh, that I'm interested in, in looking specifically at, at particular works in this show, is how a figure appears, or the possibility of a figure. What happens to make that, to take you out of the, that, the usual realm that you're in of, of uh, the, a play, a field of symbols playing with and against and, and around each other that are ambiguous, open to all sorts of uh, interpretations. But generally, sometimes, to use another one of your words, Sometimes they're hieroglyphic, they have a hieroglyphic feel. Sometimes they remind you of traditional symbols and so on, like the cross. But then sometimes there's definitely a head or a face. And I'm, how does that happen? Um, thank you. That was really um, way more interesting than what I probably have to say. Um, I think the whole notion of ambiguity has been really profound for me. Uh, even when I was in school and I came up to, or uh, in some art history class, I was really fascinated by the symbolists and how uh, they espoused the notion of ambiguity because for me there were no absolutes. Everything, if somebody sees something in black and white, it really just, ugh. Everything to me is shades of gray. And with the symbolists, they really said, hey, um, anything that I put in that work of art has no more validity than anything you might see in it. So um, depending on your gender, your culture, how you were raised, you might see something totally different. So in terms of my work, um, I think in, even in the abstraction, um, there is an element of figuration that often pops up. and. Uh, for me, it's, it's almost like a, uh, un I think it's an unconscious way of trying to establish your humanity, but still gaining some distance from it and making the work both personal and archetypal. So w w all through my so-called uh, career, I've, I've seen these, um, figures that pop up, and it's really almost a subconscious way they appear. I was telling Carter a few minutes ago, a lot of these, especially that newer one, the, uh, everybody calls it the Black Queen, but it's, I've decided it's called the Inquisitor. Um, that just formed itself when I was scumbling with, a, I had some leftover black paint. So I just went like this and, and that appeared. So a lot of this to me is there's a nature of painting that uh, is an un unconscious way that we define ourselves and understand ourselves. And for me, that kind of push-pull uh, idea of abstraction versus figuration, there's no real dividing line. They kind of merge and mesh. Um, this show, I wanted to do something that was really more in that camp, because usually it's kind of intermixed. And, you know, with uh, the idea of the symbols and so forth, I just became fascinated with all the different ways in which um, they were uh, used throughout history and different cultures with different meanings. So for me, um, in trying to answer the question, there's always that element that's kind of weaving back and forth uh, like a tree in the wind. And I would see these, then they would show up, and I would just follow that. Um, so these pa the paintings in here were ones where I really followed that just um, unconscious notion of how I would paint the process was more important than anything I tried to uh, specifically um, create. I've said this a lot of times that you, are, I, I think with a lot of painters, you almost sometimes can detach yourself from what you're doing. It's almost like an out-of-body experience. And 
I'd think, oh, I have a certain idea of where I want to go with this. But it's like, no, my hand wants to go over here. And you just have to follow that. So I think a lot of these just appeared, and yet they would take a figurative element as opposed to my more, uh, I call myself a neo-symbolic abstract painter, which if you tell someone on the street, they'll go, huh? <laughs> but anyway, it's, it, for me, it's a good definition. Um, talking about following some, the implications of something that emerges uh, on this painting back here, the big one with the vertical figure. You, you said that the, the head appeared much the way the head in this one appeared, that uh, you were just making marks or putting down paint and it, 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 looked, like, uh, it looked like a human head. But at that point, does it, you, you were saying it's unconscious, um, and then you, you see it, and it's conscious. And, but the rest of the figure, that's, I mean, you're taking the cue from the original sort of apparition or appearance. That's right? a good word. <laughs> because that seems pretty, more than in some of the other paintings, that seems definitely, the body seems definitely intended to be figured. That, in that case. Yeah. yeah, and that one, you can see underneath, there was a whole nother painting that I didn't like. And there's several of them around here that I just would come back to, so to speak, and I just go, this isn't working. And I just start screwing around with paint or with whatever. And that one, this white one, if you look in the face in the upper right, Again, that just showed up, and then I follow where that's going. In that case, I was just playing around. Um, actually, it's not done with brushes, it's done with sticks. And I was just playing around with what the sticks might do in enamel, because I liked the way it ran. And then th that face showed up, um, literally without any um, implication or effort on my part. And then, yeah, I kind of followed it around. But how those kind of arms showed up, it's, it's just completely part of the process. Mm -hmm. I think process is so important in art because a painter is painting, you know, he's making marks, she. Um, and you have to give that authority. You have to realize that where that's how that's translating from the nomenclature of who you are then becomes something that's relevant and uh, for me it's a spiritual experience. And have you ever had someone give your work a strictly formalist interpretation? Mm, well, what comes to mind was the paintings I did in the 80s, I mean, um, they were diptychs. I was really into the notion of Gnosticism and the Manichaeans and that give and take, which is almost, an, which is an Eastern sensibility. So for me, in a way, those two panels, they were separate, but there would be little crossovers. Of, of how they configured. And to me, that was about as far as I could say it was a formalist. They, they had a recipe, so to speak. Uh -huh. So um, usually one side had a dominant color or effort, and the other one might be just something completely arbitrary. But it, I would just start to see how they would work. And those paintings were very big. They were all about 80 by 100. And um, for me, those, there was a lot of figured ele elements in those too, um, but just the play of the colors and the forms was something I was really more interested in. Mm -hmm. In spite of the f fact that everybody thought I was Rasputin. <laughs> You're the guy that painted those? Um. Oh gosh, something just got away from me uh, that I wanted to ask. Um, well, in over the years and, and decades now, do you feel that the responses that you've gotten directly, either through 
in written form or people just talking to you about your work. Do you feel that, that there's a, there, there has been a response or a conscious response to the, to the range of meaning in your work, the, the, the possibilities opened up by the ambiguity of it? I mean, in other words, I, in, a, in a phrase, do you feel people are getting this about your work? Well, the openness of it. Yeah, what comes to mind specifically about that, again, if it just pops into my head, I'll go there. I have a new series that are called The Crossroads. And it looks like a big cross on, on the field. Of It still has this sort of symbolic um, hieroglyphics in the background, sort of like what you see in here, this sort of... Uh, language that I use. I, I'm really fascinated by the Byzantine monograms and so forth. It, it would say, here I'm Xrog and I come from this village and I'm a carpenter and my family's roots are from here. And they're just really, they're so beautiful. But my, the pieces that are like that are very, um, I would say formalist, but the, again, the notion of ambiguity that always creeps back into it. I didn't get the idea about making a big cross. I was looking at it out of an airplane as I was kind of coming into LA. And as you were in the desert, you would see these beautiful kind of roads. And some of these roads were very small and they would go up into fire trails and just disappear. And I was fascinated about the idea of crossroads and what metaphors they are for our life. And so um, th this idea came to me. But obviously, it's going to reference uh, a cross, a Christian, Christianity uh, aspect. But again, there's the notion of ambiguity yeah. that pops in. Because if I explain it, they say, oh, it makes perfect sense. But if you first see them, um, it's it, everyone's um, background and so forth is going to see them as crosses, which, which is fine with me. Because um, even, even if you take a Christian aspect to it, it has a multitude of meanings and uh, expressions in, uh, throughout history. I want to ask you about I mean, there's art, and then there's art, the art world, and then there's the larger world. And something, I, I suppose I've always thought about this, but I'm thinking about it a lot, much, uh, much more recently than I have in the past, or much more deliberately. The place of art, I mean, there, you know, usually art makes the news outside you know, the art magazines, uh, for something that really doesn't have anything to do with art. Uh, it's either an auction result or somebody gets fired or somebody, you know, what a, I mean, or somebody gets sued. <laughs> you know, and the, the aesthetic content of most news that in, the, in mainstream sources is, is about zero. Uh, so, and yet, that can't, that can't be an accurate reflection of the place of, of art in our world. Uh, skipping over the not all that, ultimately, that interesting relationship of art to the art world, I, I want to ask you what, how you see art in, in the larger world. I mean, uh, our society, our culture, uh, or in pe people's lives in, in general. Well, it... it I think you can need to go from someone who has no art background to someone who probably has some sensibility. I think the art that really is important and means something uh, is, is art that uh, does two things. It, it is in, intensely personal. It has to come from really deep with inside. Um, if you looked in terms of the art world and how maybe, I always thought, well, what would an African Bushman think of seeing some of these art pieces that are very <coughs> austere, very sublime, very ironic and clever? And what would the, their take be on it? And, and sometimes it really informs a lot of my work. 
Um, so that's a very important, valid question. The artist that comes to mind that I'm just in awe of, and you can always, you can always sit at an art dinner, everybody's ready to attack you. Well, who's the most, most important of the latter half of the 20th century? And they're just waiting to knock you down. And I said, <clears throat> Philip Guston. So you'll always win the argument at dinner. So, but what he did, and I like to think whether it's somebody in New York or some Middle West farmer who voted for Trump, um, or this person who their experience with art, uh, say in their cultural uh, sensibility, something has to be universal in that. There, there's an, for me, art that really works is intensely per personal, but it has this archetypal sensibility. It, 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 there's no way that it, it cannot affect you. When you see these Gustins with these crazy little guys smoking cigarette cigars and marching uh, their car, little cars in these incredibly bizarre backgrounds, you just cannot deny how important and relevant they are in terms of being, I don't know if you guys know, he found his father in a closet uh, hung by a light bulb cord. And, and you can see how that uh, figures into the work, which makes it so personal. But it, again, if you just look at that end result, and you never knew that or anything about us, and I'd like to think that someone who's totally n not in our Western culture could not be affected by those pieces. And, and that's where, for me, it really becomes, again, that notion of ambiguity and symbolism, because they will affect you on some deep, subconscious, archetypal way. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, the, the, that's an interesting... Uh, Digression? No, I, the answer to the question of who is the most important, I mean, I, uh, because, you know, people will say, Oh, Jackson Pollock or Andy Warhol. I mean, there, there are a number. Uh, I, I think in a funny way, the, the, uh, the art world never got over the shock of, of his transition to, to uh, recognizable images. And he was acknowledged and, and, uh, and certainly praised and respected in a way, but they, they still are not fully accepted in some way, perhaps. But I wanted to draw a contrast between his more specific uh, images. I mean, there, it's probably the case that just every human being can get a circle with two dots and a, you know, and a, read that as a face. And his, some of his images are pretty close to that. You know, they're, they're extremely schematic. And they draw on that, uh, that ability, which maybe even infants have, to recognize a face. And then he puts them in certain situations which are specific to America, but probably have meaning outside. Uh, and then there's the way they're, they're painted, the, the touch. And that sort of makes a transition to what I want to say about your work, that the, the, for, for the most part, these figurative images <coughs> Uh, are not as specific as Gustin's, but the touch is more prominent. And I think that's another thing that people respond to. Perhaps uh, it's very difficult to talk about, even if you've spent a long time trying to talk about it, how a gesture on a flat surface takes on meaning. Uh, I think it has something to do with a shared sense of the body and the body's energies and the body's uh, ability to, to uh, make its presence known to other bodies. I mean, in gestural painting like yours, there's a kind of a circuit. It goes, it, you're not face to face with somebody. The, the, your gestural energy is sort of rerouted through the image and it sort of <laughs> comes out uh, the, the, say, say you weren't here and, and the gallery were empty except for one person standing in front of the, uh, 
a painting, I think, unless the person were totally distracted, that, that there would be a feeling of bodily energy coming to, coming somehow off or through or from the painting. And it might be conscious, it might be unconscious. Uh, people who are used to looking at Norman Rocco and photographs and so on may not be consciously aware of gestural energy and the meaning it takes on when you respond to it. But I think it still happens even in a case like that. And that, that uh, that's one of the ways that, that these figures of yours, I mean, they're, they seem to be going two ways at once, or all ways at once. They, they, the gestural energy, which in most of your work leads one to say that you're an abstract painter, is drawing them back into that field of brush marks and, and, and fields of, of color. Uh, at the same time, they're emerging from it. So that you have, uh, and, and uh, the viewer from moment to moment or different viewers can put themselves anywhere or, or re be responding to what's going on at any point on that continuum of being drawn back into the purely gestural energy or responding to the figure that's emerging or somehow being formed and, and uh, prompted to em emerge from it. And the, the, the other thing, and this leads back to that question of where art is in society, where art is in culture, or where art is among other people, other than the artist, um, that there's a creative aspect to the response. In other words, I think you, we were, you were saying this before, uh, when, when we were talking previously, that you have, in a certain way, no idea of what people are going to be getting from your work, and that sometimes you're surprised by it. Uh, and that that, far from being a, a, a clash, or some kind of opposition, or some kind of difficulty, just parenthetically, uh, there have been um, dogmatic approaches to art, not just in New York, but elsewhere, that try to define as an error an unexpected response. But it seems to me that you're, you're opening up a, a range of, you're, the image is open in a way that goes in exactly the opposite direction. The, the, the more varied, the more unexpected, the more, in a certain sense, uh, you could even say unauthorized, the response is, the, the better. And that, that there's a kind of bond, then, that develops. People get a sense of themselves. They become more aware of their own responses. And in, in the course, there's a kind of what used to be called self-consciousness, a kind of self-awareness. But you're also aware of other op if you're a part of a community of people who are involved with art, you're also aware that there are other often very different responses. And far from being a problem, that's an occasion for a kind of communication, kind of coming together in a certain way. Not to resolve the differences, because I don't even know it's so helpful to think of them as differences, at least not in a, a, a pejorative sense, but of just the full range of of alternative possibilities. And I, I'm arguing, I actually cued by some things that you said in your statement, that that's a social value. That it's not, it's not a purely aesthetic value, that it's a social value, and that, that ultimately a culture is built up out of that kind of communication and exchange. A lot of which is not ever verbalized, you know. I mean, one of the things about painting is that it's nonverbal, <laughs> and, and that you can't, I mean, I know this, having written about art for a long time, that, you know, you're always writing, you're writing around it. You know, maybe you can say things that sort of point people in an interesting direction, but finally, it's a, it's a nonverbal experience.
and perhaps the experience of uh, the experience of, of, of joining with others in a, in a in a well, the art world is a subculture, but <laughs> <laughs> then there's the larger culture. That that experience of, of joining with others in, in, in a fabric of, of meanings that are sort of woven together is for the most part unarticulated. You know, you, you sort of know when it's happening. You can kind of feel it happening, but you can't all, you can't really finally pin it down. Uh, and I think that's a big difference. Well, no, I won't say that. I was about to say that's the difference between people who, who work in, in visual mediums versus people who work in verbal mediums. But in fact, people who work in verbal mediums in a creative way are always trying to get beyond a determinate meaning in, in language. And uh, a definition of language ba badly used or an example of language badly used is when you try to pin down meanings and say there's one right definition of a word or a thing that should be said at a certain time or, or, or whatever. So I think that, that's, one, that's one thing that keeps poets coming back to look at, at, uh, at art. Poets like to write about poetry, but they also, a lot of poets have written about art. It, it's sort of getting outside your, maybe you could even say getting outside your comfort zone with something that's analogous, you know, where you you, uh, you 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 try to say something about the ultimately unsayable, in the hopes that not that you can ultimately ever pin it down, but that you can sort of circle around it, maybe highlight a few things, point at things, and uh, that maybe not always, but sometimes there'll be a benefit to that. Um, so, but again, th these, these ideas uh, uh, circling around here were cued by your, your notion that there's a social aspect to it, that, that this is part of, uh, as personal as it is, and as much as it has to do with self-definition and, and a kind of spiritual transcendence that is inward and you know, that, Ultimately, that's something that, that's, that's shared or lead, leads to some connection outside the inwardness of each individual person, artist, audience, and, and commentator, and so on. Um, to follow that up or to continue that thought, I have always uh, cherished that netherworld of the sublime and the infinite, where you're just really trying to translate some thoughts or ideas into a visual format, uh, again, that is very personal, but just everything that we picked up throughout our um, nomenclature of beingness. Um, one thing, uh, for whatever it pops into my head, like some of these <laughs> images and paintings, um, Carter wrote something, again, uh, where you, your attempt to make sense of what you do um, is called into question constantly by um, your process. And um, Carter wrote a really wonderful essay for a museum show I had a few years, a million years ago, um, where there was certainly that notion of symbolism and the ambiguity of meetings, but he talked about the process by which the pain is applied by the translucency of the mediums I was using. I was using a lot of uh, uh, in wax, kind of not so much encaustic, but a wax medium. And it gave those paintings just this brilliance, this almost um, Renaissance-like beauty. and. Uh, I was fascinated by that myself, just how that visually appeared and how when you looked at it, it would resonate with you. Uh, Carter wrote how much the brushwork was um, not just part of the painting, but may, maybe a very large part of the painting. And um, how the paint was applied, how the end result uh, 
was so much, had, had as much importance as the imagery or even the abstract quality that was uh, prevalent in the piece. So um, that was very illuminating for me because uh, it was something that somebody else saw in it that I didn't really think about. You know, it's, uh, there's always this fine line between being self-indulgent, where you just, your process becomes not so much about a larger perspective, but something where you go in so much that it, it's not really speaking to an audience. It's not really even speaking to yourself in a way. It, it has this almost false quality to me. I see a lot of work like that. Um, and so much of the work I see now is uh, so ironic that it, in, in the way it moves ahead, it, it loses something in the translation. You'll see so much work that's like, oh, I've seen that, well, I'll do a twist on it. And the person who does a twist on it goes, well, I'll do a twist on that. And it just keeps going almost infinitely. And then you're left with this maelstrom of nothing. And uh, that's why I can come out of museums and so forth, uh, very depressed. Uh, but you know, when you really see something that matters, in terms of that, that you have a dialogue with that object. Mm -hmm. You know, somehow, I have this expression that I've really grown to love, I hope it's not self-indulgent. Does a work of art sing to you? You know, is it, it's, and music and poetry, and I, by the way, I love how poets write about art because it's such a wonderful perspective outside of this didactic nonsense. They have a very different view of it. But um, um, again, just, just that process. And I, 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 if, if a work of object just, you go, wow. You know, I, I don't care what it is. Um, and this gets into a larger um, discussion. I've been just doing, uh, taking, you know, iPhone photographs. I walk down the street and there's a blob of paint, or a blob of, uh, maybe it's just the mixture they're using to do something on the building. And I'm fascinated by it. Um, it, it, it to me, it has every bit of validity and meaning uh, whether it's intended or not. And it's something that's that automatic quality. Uh, Carter had the uh, monumental task a few years ago in the Brooklyn Rail of like, what is the definition, in definition of art? And you know, is it limited to people that have an intentional process of creating art? Or as opposed, is it something that could just be discovered and found in nature? And I was talking about some steel that I saw on the floor uh, of a building, and I, all these different chemicals had been used, and it was just gorgeous. Now, is that art because the intention wasn't there? But to me, it was more beautiful than any of these big, bombastic, macho Sarahs out there. There was just a beauty in it. Um, y y you know, when you, um, when after it rains for, you know, if it hasn't rained for a long time, you see these by the gutters and the water mixes in with that, these beautiful little oil patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like rainbows and they, it, from diff different views, you can just see this wonderful, um, just color, uh, pattern, and those are things that affect me really profoundly. Uh, and, and I think that's part of that whole way we define and get involved with the art. I, I don't want to get too much into the uh, uh, objective reality of that, but it, it, it's something, again, that Carter was discussing that for me, that, again, the netherworld of that is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, this question of intention, uh, there, there wasn't, this didn't really become an issue that people talked about um, until the first collage was made, and then, then Duchamp really brought it to the fore.
Uh, and then much later, I mean, Duchamp had an extraordinary effect and, and influence and so on. And it led, and in the spirit of the Duchampian, um, I don't know if it's a tactic or a strategy of um, just designating something as a work of art. Um, that reminds me of a funny anecdote, which I'll try to work in. Uh, but what I'm getting at is that many, many decades later, Robert Smithson uh, summed up that Duchampian possibility by saying, uh, an artist uh, can create an, a work of art with a glance. And it's not quite clear what he meant by that, but, but it had something to do with bringing and openness to the aesthetic and, and supra-aesthetic meanings and values uh, of art to the world at large. And that's another way of getting at this social aspect of it, because society takes place in a, in a it has its being uh, and evolves in, in, a, in a world. And so that, so that I, I was talking about the exchange between um, artwork and, and viewer, implicitly artwork and artist, that goes, that has a social aspect. It's part of a weave of exchanged meanings and so on that sustains, helps sustain society. But then there's also the, the world beyond society, just the world. And, and I think that that capacity to find meaning, to respond to meaning, to invent meaning, I'm talking now as a viewer more than as an artist, uh, can carry over into the larger world and one can have a creative uh, relationship to that and I think many people do. I mean, it's pointed out time and again that Kant's, uh, Immanuel Kant's account of the aesthetic, uh, he, was he was in a, a in Königsberg, which was a provincial German town, not, you know, in the Protestant north, not much art. Uh, so he, he said all these things that people apply to painting and sculpture, but he didn't really see much painting and sculpture. What he mostly saw was nature. And so that there, that's another ambiguity. Uh, the, the, the realm of works of art that are intended and offered and appreciated as works of art versus just everything else of which it's a part. And ultimately, there's not a clear distinction. I mean, sure, you wouldn't, ex you wouldn't uh, uh, mistake a painting for a tree, but, but there's a continuity between your, the kind of response you have to a painting and the kind of response you can have to a tree or a forest or a sunset or whatever. And of course that cycles back into art. Um, or at least it did, it began to in the late Middle Ages when, when nature became an acceptable subject uh, for, for artists to deal with. Um, the, that story I wanted to tell about Duchamp, was, there was a, a, a panel uh, it raises the issue of beauty uh, and what that means. There was once an interview between Larry Rivers and David Hockney that was published in a magazine called Art and Literature. Uh, do you want your art to be beautiful or interesting? Um, because beauty, I remember this from when I first showed up in the, in the, uh, the art world in the late 60s, it was at the, it had been going, I sensed that it had been going on for some time, this sort of suspicion of beauty, that beauty was too specialized a quality, too, too, too arty, so to speak. And that um, you somehow had to get beyond uh, beauty. Which Duchamp may have felt. There was a panel that he was on with uh, William Rubin, who was the successor to Alfred Barr at the Museum of Modern Art. You know, these curators and directors who, who really did a lot to shape uh, and I think ultimately to limit our, our idea of what serious art is. Uh, 
But anyway, the panel had William Rubin and his sort of father figure, Alfred Barr, and Duchamp. And, and Rubin, who was a trained histor art historian, which I don't think Barr was, uh, kept asking him art historical questions, like how do you choose what formal qualities does an object have to have? You know, and, and finally, um, you know, Duchamp would always say, well, I, I don't, I'm not really interested. I'm a defrocked artist. I'm not really interested in the formal qualities. You know, I just do them to amuse myself and, and, and so on. And Alfred Barr piped up and said, but uh, Marcel, if you don't care about their aesthetic qualities, why are they all so beautiful? And Duchamp said, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> so that was a, a really brilliant reflection of that suspicion of beauty. But I think we're, we're sort of getting over that. Uh, not, we may not be getting over Duchamp, but I think we're, th that the idea of beauty, it's not a sentimental idea, it's not a stereotyped idea. And it's, it's just another word for the, the, these things that are uh, extreme and, and kind of indescribable importance for us, you know, the, the values and meanings that you're calling transcendent. And that, that beauty it has kind of is beginning to get back its respectability. Uh, and it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's never predictable. And it, it might be surprising the way people uh, apply it sometimes. Uh, but that I think that many of the works in, in this show are, are, are beautiful in surprising ways. You know, they're not whatever you think of in, in an ordinary sense as, as being beautiful. Uh, these paintings don't have those qualities, but, they, but that if once you start to respond to them, that that's a, that's a good and a, a strong word to, de, to describe the, the, what they are. They're, they're really beautiful. And that that's not, a, that's not a narrow aesthetic quality. It's an immense, wide open. Expression. Yeah. Um, taking a cue from that in terms of some of the work here, um, again, a lot of time, you think about painting. Painting's still about painting, and it's about what paint does. Um, these kids came in and were pointing out all these kind of interesting aspects. Well, is the, is the man mesmerizing the woman and blah, blah, blah? Is she trying to say no? And to be honest, I didn't even see that. I mean, it sounds like impossible. These connections kind of formed themselves. But I was, what I was really interested in here is just the way this oil dripped. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, acrylic doesn't do that. It doesn't form these beautiful little riblets. And for me, the way this darker mass uh, surrounds this kind of openness, and it's almost like a mist. And I find that in my, a lot of my paintings now that, have, that it really has that beautiful um, element of just how paint works. And um, again, that was something that I was really pleasantly surprised in uh, Carter's essay about my work in that he saw these beautiful aspects that weren't so much about the symbolist nature or uh, history or whatever, but it was just the process and how the paint was applied. And, this one has, there's, well, there's one I can think of that's even more so, but since it's not here. Um, something that calls into question for me that idea of beauty, I mean, if you think in history, uh, especially the Renaissance, and, you know, there's the big three, and just, it's not just the imagery, it's how they paint. And, and it's extraordinary. It's the technique that finally comes out. The way Leonardo does these little wisps of hair. I didn't really care about who he was talking about, whatever. I was just mesmerized by that little technique there. That was beautiful to me. And 
you know, if we go back a little bit to uh, Cimabue, or especially, you know, when everything had to fit maybe in the 12 or 1300s, this iconic format that looked so uh, stylized in terms of what the Christian church would allow. And then all of a sudden you've got Giotto with these just incredibly in, intense emotional uh, looks and faces, and again, to me, that's beautiful. In that, he really broke away from that tradition. I, I really think he is that kind of Arshile Gorky of the time, where you're moving from this formless, completely formless view. All these guys look the same, into a, a more humane or human element, and really transitioned into. Um, still within a, 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 a religious uh, structure that they all seem to have to do unless they were banned and burned at the stake. Um, so we're all used to that, but I just saw the other day, it was a reproduction somewhere, um, and I, I don't know, is it Pontormo or, that has that beautiful painting, Lady with the Long Neck? And, and there's something, again, it, does, it's, it sings to me. And it's just the way, it, you know, that's after Renaissance, what the hell are we going to do? You know, this is like the ultimate. So they went back into a kind of, um, I, I, I hate to use that word again, but self-indulgent, but, well, let's do something that's more exotic with it. I, I think El Greco was somebody who really just took that and went somewhere. But this, the, I actually was lucky enough to see it at the Uffizi, I think, I'm pretty sure it's there, Lady with the Long Neck. And there's just something about how the movement in that painting just um, moved me so um, powerfully because it, it just, it, there was something in the painting that was very different from the Renaissance. And, and it was something about, they seemed more like they were trying to say something more exotic and elegant, but still personal. And to me, that, again, it sings to me. I, I just, so much of the standard Renaissance pieces can get a little old, but that, that particular painting was just pivotal to me. I just love, and the way she's looking, and the way her hands are moving and her fingers elongated. Um, I think that was an amazing time in terms of uh, beauty. One other thing I wanted to say, um, in terms of process, I've always, I haven't said this in a long time, but um, it's based on uh, a, taking a cue from Carter. Um, I always said years ago that my painting was way ahead of me in terms of who I am. Um, I would finish a painting and I, I would be unsure of it. Uh, and, and yet, I knew there was something valid and important about it. And a lot of times w with uh, works of art, if I'm not sure about something, I'll put it away for a while. And you either, like in the case of, of uh, the big piece there, I knew there was something that quixotic about it, and I was either going to pull it out and love it, or I was going to hate it. Um, but again, a lot of times I would do something and think it's like five years ahead of my understanding of what I was even thinking of or trying to accomplish. It's like it had a mind or soul of its own. I think that's where you can get into that idea of transcendence, because those pieces the, the really profound ones just, they knocked me out once when I did them, but even later when I realized they were so far ahead of my consciousness and where I was, what I was thinking at the time. It's like, how do I do this? How do these, how do these works of art just appear magically and they, they get me and <laughs> where I'm going down the road without me intending it? And I, I just thought that was not just a lucky thing, but if, if you attune to that, it, that, again, process takes over and allows that to come forth. You know, it really is magical. Well, it's interesting. We were discussing this Cuspid article.
uh, about on the spiritual and art, concerning the spiritual and art by uh, Kandinsky, where he was railing against the materialism of the time, which is like, you know, a, a grain of sand in a beach compared to what we're dealing with now. But um, I think Kandinsky, as well as say uh, Malevich and Mondrian, were taking a very uh, spiritual aspect to the not only to the work but to where they felt uh, art should be and how it should uh, um, extrapolate from something that's maybe normal to something that is transcendent, transcendent and vital in terms of uh, the uh, sensibility they were working with. You know whether whether it was uh, Carter was talking about Bar Newman, Barnett Newman, but when you think of where Mondrian was going with those relationships between the uh, more geometric figures, but there's an intense kind of just mag again magic about how they really uh, work formally and in a spiritual sensibility for me. That's a good question. Um, not overtly. Um, sometimes in dreams, if you, if you, I've always been told this, and, it, and it, I think it's true, if you write down your dreams right away when you wake up, they'll stay with you. And um, I think it's more of a feeling that you, you take away from the dreams. I, I don't say, I wouldn't actually look at anything. I wouldn't actually say that there's um, a specific, uh, we can edit that out, don't worry. Um, I wouldn't say there's a specific uh, reality to seeing certain figures uh, and then translating them visually because, again, everything here exists in that, uh, again, I love that word, netherworld of possibilities. So, as we pretty much discussed as a theme, uh, I think throughout this conversation, is, is at least my work and so much other work that I find profound, it exists in this uh, spatial and emotional and psychic uh, tension. Um, one of the things I really try to do, especially I'd say in this one, and. Uh, uh, that's a bit obvious, but um, in, say, even that kind of figured element, there's always this um, non-describable sense of space. I like the idea that my paintings could look intensely shallow and intensely deep at the same time, because they're, they're bouncing back and forth between uh, th that reality. Um, so, and, it's, and that's very much in the process of of, of what we talked about symbolism, in that there's no way to define. Is it shallow? Is it deep? Well, it's both. So um, that's kind of where it goes. Um, I'll just say this. I, uh, I did this for a show in Sun Valley, Idaho, where I painted the whole wall with these kind of hieroglyphic uh, pictogram, um, Byzantine symbols, and I literally just do it. And it, I, I think it's some kind of subconscious language for me, but I literally can paint a whole wall like that. Um, it's more literal when I'm doing it uh, just in the black and white. But um, it, it again, it's something personal. I can't put a name on it, but it's something I haven't seen anywhere else. And so, uh, I'm not going to try to define it. It's just something that exists in that kind of uh, unconscious sensibility. Something that you know and feel. Hmm? That you know and feel. Yeah, and, and it's indescribable a lot of times. I, I, I can't put a finger on it. It just, uh, with one of the discussions we've had a lot, a lot about here was that these things just kind of show up. And I'm amazed that uh, I said in that white piece up there, that face started by just scumbling with leftover paint. In this one called Fish Scream, uh, 
the little figures uh, just showed up and then, you know, I, I was just making marks. And then I'd think, oh, this looks like this and that looks like that. And yet it describes, that's one of the few that really describes an incident. But how it was translated, how it was developed and, and came to fruition was completely arbitrary and uh, um, I had no control over really other than I followed the way I made a mark in that. Process is, has to do with just making marks and applying paint to canvas, but I think that everything that you've experienced and known then kind of sublimates itself into that process and, and becomes part of how you make that mark and how that mark can be uh, uh, objective, but it's subjective at the same time. It exists in that kind of uh, world of in-between. I love the idea that there's no specific meaning or idea to any of these and my work in general and to a lot of the work I feel very strongly about. Um, there's so many different interpretations you can have, and to me that allows the work to breathe. It really gives it a sense of, of uh, being mysterious and having so many different uh, ideas behind it. And, and if I see something to me that looks one-dimensional, it's like, oh yeah, I get it. And then I, I, I have no more dialogue with it. It's like, oh, I see what they're trying to do. And then it, it bores me. And, you know, that's just me. Um, but <laughs> I, I'd say, you know, maybe for a lot of us that could be true. And especially now, when so much... I, I, one thing that was really, I think, really important and, and pivotal, Walter Robinson came up with this wonderful expression, because so much work, you know, see, New, I think it was in uh, New York Magazine or something where there's like f 12 or 14 painters and they're all basically kind of doing the same thing. You know, maybe there's a little mark here or this or this guy's a little more hazy, but they're just these kind of bland overall paintings. And he called them zombie formalism. <laughs> and, and that... Yeah, that and, is a good phrase. And when I ran into him, yeah. I said, are you making any money off that? And, he's, <laughs> and he said, no, but I should. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Jerry Salt picked up on it, and, and that was what the article was about. But to me, that's where, you know, you know we get so ironic that... And some of this art goes for $100,000, and yet you think, or more, and you just think, where's the really important idea behind it? Who, who is saying that this is now worth as much money? I just, I don't have a clue. It's, it's interesting you say that. I did an, uh, a couple interviews when I was in uh, Shanghai a uh, number of years ago, and it's interesting, the commentator knew nothing about art, but he act, asked very interesting questions. He said, What's, what come first, idea or, or the process? And I said, the process. I said, most artists will tell you that, that you put paint on canvas and the ideas come from that. In my case, that's totally true. Uh, at least nine times out of ten. Um, I, I'm, I just, uh, in terms of literal uh, means, a lot of times I'll just start drawing with leftover paint and then I'll just see where it goes. You know, I think the, uh, an element of really painting is that element of surprise. When you're just surprised at what's happening and you follow that and you have to be true to that. And if you are, you're really going to come up with something significant. I said something to Carter before this about, you know, an ultimate statement for me. And he said, yeah, say that, say that. Uh, so, you know, art is, in its grandest moments, 
inexplicably coherent, it is transcendent in its meaning, and it has the power to elevate a consideration of human life. And that's just, if you take that, it, su it sums up everything we've talked about today. I can't believe I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> it's something you would say.